From the early days of street thugs to the far-reaching arms of the Commission, the American Mafia has always been believed to be a largely Italian affair. But there had always been a strong Jewish connection, especially in the early part of the 20th century. Though there were mobs and gangs of varying groups, the Jewish or Yiddish Mafia were some of the most influential and the most ruthless. Known as the Kosher Nostra or Unsashtik, they were prolific in bootlegging, founded Las Vegas, and were an integral part of the Mafia's group of assassins, Murder, Inc. This is Mafia, the Jewish Connection. In the early 20th century, hundreds of thousands of immigrants settled in New York City. Among them were Italians, mostly from the south of Italy, and Jews from Eastern Europe. Author Eric Desenhall. The history of organized crime in America is basically the history of immigration. The Jewish influx came basically before the Italian influx, which is why the Jewish rackets were bigger before the Italian rackets got big. And so it was all a function of timing. If you look back in the mid-1800s, you had Irish people who got here before that, so they predominated. So when people talk about the religions and races that are involved with organized crime, you can really just trace it back to when they got here. The man largely considered the father of modern organized crime was Arnold Rothstein, a Jewish gambler from New York City. Rothstein was the son of a wealthy businessman who could have become a successful banker or a stockbroker. Instead, he chose to make money through high-stakes gambling rackets. His biggest racket? He claimed to have fixed the 1919 World Series. Crime author Selwyn Rabb. He had heard that uh, some Chicago White Sox players were unhappy with their owner, Charles Comiskey. And Comiskey was known for being a cheapskate, not paying them what they were worth, and even, and even skimping on giving them bonuses for being the best team in the American League and, and obviously the best, best bet to win the World Series. So what happened was Rothstein heard somebody he knew had a connection to White Sox players, and he sent the word that there could be big dough to the players if they double-crossed Kaminsky, took a bribe, and blew the World Series. And some of these players thought this was a way of revenge, retaliation for Kaminsky underpaying them. And that was the way Rothstein, through intermediaries, got to the White Sox players. Nicknamed The Brain, Rothstein was the man who taught the mob to think like a business, act like a business, and look like a business. He became a mentor to rough street thugs who would become notorious and powerful mobsters themselves. Journalist Doug Valentine. The original mafia bosses in New York probably emerged in, at the very end of the uh, 19th century, at a time when... Um, uh, Immigration was booming in New York City, um, what they called the, the mustache peats. They were in power through the 1920s. And at that particular time, um, because of their prohibition on their uh, subordinates from actually getting involved in, in narcotics in an uh, industrial way, um, uh, narcotic trafficking in the United, in, in the United States, um, largely out of New York, but in every other city as well, fell under the auspices of Arnold Rothstein, who was a, a very powerful Jewish gangster. Um, he was the um, premier American gangster of the 1920s, involved in uh, labor racketeering, in bookmaking, in bootlegging, and and he, he also had a... Um, um, a monopoly on the importation of and distribution of narcotics in the United States. People like Lucky Luciano, um, Frank Costello, they they were apprentices 
of Arnold Rothstein. They saw the fantastic amounts of money that were that could be made. Crime author Selwyn Rabb. Rothstein saw that prohibition was big bucks. And what he did was you had to turn people from thugs into mob executives. You had to learn how to, one, manufacture booze and beer, two, how to deliver it, three, how to market it, and four, how to safeguard your supply because they were rivals. Bootleggers were <laughs> hijacking each other's quantities. Rothstein was a gangster unlike any other. He didn't have a gang, he didn't do violence, and he worked with the people who suited him at a particular time in the pursuit of his business ventures. What he did was, in different projects, different operations, he used different people, whoever was valuable or he thought could fit in. Now, when it came to prohibition, the mobsters didn't, the gangsters in those times were mainly street thugs. What they did was they prayed, Jewish gangsters prayed on Jewish neighborhoods, Irish and Irish neighborhoods, Italians and Italian neighborhoods. A lot of it was just robberies, extortion from shopkeepers. The gangster norm was to stick to your own group. Most gangs were primarily of one ethnic bearing. Mobsters were especially suspicious of anyone who might be different and therefore untrustworthy. But things were starting to change, and Rothstein wasn't the only one shaking it up. In Chicago in the 1920s, famous bank robber and cocaine kingpin Al Capone was known for his love of publicity, but he was also known for bringing gangsters together. Crime author Lawrence Burgreen. That made Capone unique was the fact that he built a criminal coalition across ethnic lines. Almost all other gangsters at that time in Chicago, in New York, and other cities um, led gangs that ran strictly across ethnic lines. Certain kinds of Italians, or Jews, or Poles, or Irish, or even Welsh. Um, Capone was a coalition builder. He would have been a very successful politician uh, because he put together a coalition of these gangsters. Um, they often hated each other and mistrusted each other. Nevertheless, he got them to work together for their economic advantage. Um, he was particularly close with Jewish gangsters. He learned Yiddish so he could speak with them. Back in New York, however, many of the old school gangsters were stuck in their old ways. The different groups wouldn't even mix, let alone collaborate with others. This was especially true of old Italian mafia bosses. Gangsters like Genovese family boss Joe Mazzaria only trusted their own people. But some of the younger Italians, like Charles Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, who had come to the U.S. as young children, were different. They were friends with Jewish kids like Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. Crime author Ernest Volkman. One of, one, of the, one of the major reasons why there was a falling out between people like Luciano Costello and the other younger generation of mafioso and the old mustache peach, as they were contemptuously described, was anti-Semitism. Masseria hated Jews. And to his shock, uh, he found out Luciano was palling around with this guy named Meyer Lansky and other Jews. As a matter of fact, one day he was shocked to discover Luciano was having dinner in Ratner's, which is a very famous Jewish restaurant in uh, lower Manhattan, and developed a real fondness for Jewish food. Meyer Lansky had been a street thug for most of his life. As a teenager, he had partnered up with his friend Ben Bugsy Siegel to form what they called the Bugs Meyer Mob. Together, they made good money by roughing up pushcart drivers and bootlegging. Crime author Ernest Volkman. No, the Bugsmeyer mob was, was percolating along. Prohibition helped them because now suddenly this gang of, of petty thieves, which is what they were fundamentally, suddenly could start making real money by running uh, beer runs, by hijacking trucks. And things really started when a young Lansky met Luciano. Author Eric Desenhall. Famously, Luciano tried to shake him down, and Meyer told him uh, in no uncertain terms, in very colorful language, where he could get off. You think that because I'm Jewish, I'm just going to fork over money. That's not going to happen today, buddy. 
The partnership of Luciano and Lansky set the wheels in motion for organized crime to really become a business. Lansky was the idea man, and Luciano had the charisma and the connections. Ernest Volkman. The Jews know a lot about organized crime. We know a lot about organized crime. They have operations, we have operations, and if we cooperate, we'll all make a lot of money. I'm really excited to tell you about the sponsor for today's show. It's a fantastic new novel by New York Times best-selling author Andrew Gross. Get this description. Button Man brings to life the birth of organized crime in 1930s New York City through the story of one family. Now you know why I'm excited. You're going to love this book. Button Man is part historical thriller, part family saga. You've got great descriptions of immigrant life in New York's Lower East Side in the 20s and 30s. And the family part is partly based on Gross's own family, which is pretty cool. And then he weaves in real history. It's got appearances by mobsters Louis Lepke Buchalter, Dutch Schultz, and also special prosecutor Thomas Dewey. If you've been listening to this show, you already know all of these guys. Here's what best-selling author Linda Fairstein says about it. Button Man is a riveting piece of historical fiction, exposing the Jewish mob of the 1930s who preyed on the garment industry and the brave few who stood up against them. This book is a heartstopper. And number one New York Times best-selling author Kristen Hanna calls Button Man a compelling, fast-paced historical thriller. Fans of Boardwalk Empire and Dennis Lehane will love it. Forget Dennis Lehane. Fans of Mafia will love it. Button Man by Andrew Gross is available now in hardcover, ebook, and audio. From Minotaur Books. Go to the audio version if you can. It's really good. Button Man by Andrew Gross. The pair of Luciano and Lansky thrived even more under the mentorship of Arnold Rothstein, Selwyn Rabb. So he turned these raw mobsters into business executives. Mob, mobsters who used their brains, not just their brawn. So he saw the money, he made millions out of prohibition by working with different people. He worked with Jewish gangsters, Maya Lansky, Bugsy Siegel. He worked with Tommy Lucchese, he worked with Luciano, he worked with Schultz, he worked with the Irish gangsters. Anybody who could fit into him was fine. Luciano and Lansky and their friends would listen and learn as Arnold Rothstein taught them how to do business the American way. The key was in organizing crime operations from top to bottom and ensure everybody was making money along the way. Crime author Thomas Repetto. Rothstein taught the young gangsters who, who were moving up, if you want to be successful, dress like a successful man. Don't dress like a gangster. No white hats. You know, that sort of thing. There used to be a time in an American city when the police saw two guys in white hats driving by, they'd immediately arrest them because that was the uniform of the gangster. The Rothstein was mentor to a whole generation. Whatever you say about a lot of those gangsters, they realized that Rothstein was something special, far above them. If they want to make money, and have a connection to stay out of trouble with the law, Rothstein was the guy. Journalist Doug Valentine. So as a uh, student of Arnold Rothstein, uh, Luciano saw the um, practicality and the possibilities in the sorts of, in the way that um, Rothstein did business. He, he saw um, uh, things that, that Rothstein did that nobody else were doing, such as uh, establishing front companies for his bootlegging and uh, narcotic trafficking organizations. There were, there were things that, that Rothstein was doing that nobody else was doing, and Luciano saw the um, uh, possibilities of this. And, and he, he also um, teamed up with a, a, a person who was, had all the same thoughts, Meyer Lansky. And through that partnership and the associations 
that um, they each brought to this partnership, um, modern organized crime was born internationally and in and, and, and all sorts of different um, uh, activities. Uh, uh, funneling their money into um, Luciano was was one of the first people to see the um, with Lu with Meyer Lansky the the beauty of uh, forming casinos to launder the money that they made in other rackets. So they're they're really quite um, uh, far far thinking, and um, uh, although of course their efforts were in crime, and, and it's hard to forgive them for that. But nevertheless, that's, he was a criminal genius. Little did the old mustache Pete's like Joe Mazzaria know that Lucky Luciano and his friends had practically become the protégés of Arnold Rothstein. Crime author Ernest Volkman. But the greatest shock was to come. He discovered one day that Frank Costello had married a Jewish girl. And Lansky was the best man. At the wedding, I mean, to, to, to a Sicilian mind, like Masseria, this was absolutely unthinkable. And he said to Luciano, we don't do business with the Hebes, as he called them. I don't want them around. I don't want to have any contact with them. Luciano ignored him because Luciano was in the business of building empires and coalitions. And he said, what's the difference? Crime author Eric Desenhall. Bigotry doesn't make money. It's stagnating. If you want to make money, a true capitalist doesn't care about race or religion. And Luciano recognized that if you keep the rackets just to Italians, you cut out a lot of great earners. And the Jewish guys in those days were amazing earners. Mazaria and the gangsters like him were only standing in the way of the business-like criminal organization that Luciano and Lansky imagined for the future. Together, they employed both Jewish and Italian killers to get rid of two street gang bosses, Joe Mazaria and Salvatore Maranzano, and they used the biases against them to their advantage. Author Eric Desenholm. One of the stereotypes of the Jewish rackets is the Jewish guys handled the money and the Italian guys were the tough guys. Not true. Interestingly enough, when Luciano took over the Italian rackets, it was the Jewish muscle that played a big role. One of the guys whose name was uh, Red Levine, who was known for being an Orthodox Jew who would not kill on the Sabbath. <laughs> but Maranzano was so bigoted that he felt if some Jewish bean counter uh, IRS guys came to his office, they couldn't do him any harm. Well, not only did they do him harm, they killed him. With the other bosses out of the way, Luciano was able to call a meeting of major crime bosses from around the country. He called for the end of wars among gangs, no more segregation between ethnic groups. It was all about making money and everybody could get a cut crime author Ernest Volkman. Well, the fact that the, the, the Atlantic City meeting was between Jewish and Italian criminals. I mean, it was unprecedented. The, up to that point, you had very strict divisions between the various ethnic gangs. Jews, Jews didn't even go into Italian neighborhoods. Italians didn't even go into Jewish neighborhoods, much less cooperate on crime. And here was Luciano saying, we're going to cooperate. I don't care if he's Jewish. He doesn't care if I'm Italian. Guess what? See this dollar bill here? Okay, does that look Jewish or Italian to you? It's pretty neutral, right? That was his point. If you, if you organize and you put it on a business-like basis, who the hell cares what, what ethnic you are? It doesn't, doesn't make any difference. That whole distinction doesn't make any sense anymore. Lansky and Siegel were both present at the commission meeting, and after the National Crime Syndicate was formed, Lansky and Siegel created an organization that would help enforce its rules, Murder, Inc. In the Italian rackets, it was about the Italian mob hierarchy. Luciano had to pay attention to that, but people like Meyer Lansky and Ben Siegel and Lepke Buckhalter were very important in that broader syndication 
because if you were trying to make money, you didn't care if you were a real capitalist, what color, race, or religion you were. You cared that you could do the job. And Ben Siegel and Meyer Lansky could do the job. And they were very much, in those days, equal partners before the Italian hierarchy became what it was. Soon after, Murder, Inc. was led by Albert Anastasia and Louis Lepke Bukalter. In fact, Murder, Inc. was a multi-ethnic group of professional killers made up mostly of Italians and Jews. Selwyn Rabb. And that was one of uh, Anastasia's best gifts to the Mafia. He decided we needed a hit group of professional hitmen who could carry out whatever killings had to be done. But we didn't want them all the time to be Italian. And he knew Lepke. Actually, they lived almost in neighboring communities in Brooklyn. And Lepke had his own Jewish gang of hired hoods and killers. So it was interchangeable. Murder Incorporated existed and consisted both of Italian and Jewish murderers who went out on assignments. And the theory by using Jewish killers often was this, is that somebody would finger whoever had to be marked for death and they would send over a Jewish hitman. And the idea was if the uh, suspect or the victim was Italian, he wouldn't suspect somebody who didn't look Italian it. Crime author Bernie Whalen. If you saw uh, Burke Halter, he was a, a thin guy, uh, nothing uh, to really think of as, as a bad guy, but he apparently uh, really was. There was also a special kind of way of talking at Murder, Inc. It became well-known mafia talk. Here's Ernest Volkman again. The, the new vocabulary uh, for Mary Incorporated arose uh, among the uh, Jewish killers, uh, assigned to uh, Murder Incorporated. Most of them came from an area of Brooklyn called Brownsville. And they would sit there, and there was a phone booth, and it would ring, and they would say, but we got a job, okay? Now, one of them uh, would not uh, do any murders on Yom Kippur because he was very devoutly religious. They didn't like to use words like killing, murder, slaughter, yeah. They wanted to use business terms. So uh, to kill somebody was a, a contract, like a business. I have a contract. Um, I'm not going to take somebody and, and uh, kill them and dump them. They're, they're going to go for a ride. They're going to take for a ride. Okay. Uh, I don't want to say I'm the guy who goes and I cut the body up in little pieces and bury it someplace, or I burn it, or I dump it in the ocean in a 50-gallon drum. No, it, it, I'm an evaporator. I, I make the bodies disappear, you see. So you had all these uh, very neutral-sounding kind of business terms, which had a whole different meaning in their business. We're businessmen. After the formation of Murder, Inc., Bugsy Siegel was sent west to take over the Los Angeles Mafia for the syndicate. Author Ernest Volkman. Uh, the, the gambling activities in California, which is really what everybody was after, particularly in Los Angeles, was nominally under Dragner's control. But Ra Dragner was weak, and everybody knew it. And so when Chicago and New York made it clear that he, Dragner, was now lo no longer in charge, but would be regarded as a helpful assistant now. He got the message, and he understood, and happily welcomed Ben. Oh, Ben, how are you? Very wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Siegel was the epitome of a gangster. Tough, handsome, and brutal. He made a name for himself not only among gangsters, but among Hollywood's elite. But the traits that made him a good mobster got him into trouble. And once ousted from high society, he decided to make his own. Journalist Diana Blass. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. He's the guy who dreamt up Las Vegas. He put the glitz and glamour into Sin City. Very few people outside of Meyer and Lansky and Siegel shared this dream. I mean, it seemed incredible, especially there in the middle of no place. But Siegel pointed out, wait a minute, it's on the main highway from California. At the time, Nevada did not have a speed limit. 
So he said, people could drive here 100 miles and they could be here in a couple of hours. They're going to love it. And guess what? We've made a wonderful discovery about Americans. They love to gamble. God help us, they love to gamble. Siegel opened the glamorous Flamingo Hotel and Casino, the very foundations of Las Vegas. Unfortunately, he never lived to see the gambling paradise, but his influence remains. In the later 20th century, the lines have blurred between the Jewish connection and the Italian-American mafia, both parties working side by side to do business. But the prevalence of the Jewish mobsters only helped fuel public anti-Semitism. And the presence of Jewish-American gangsters mostly faded after World War II. But their influence still remains as characters in popular culture, books, and films. In the next bonus episode. For decades, the mob had influence in every aspect of society, and there was nothing the law could do. But there was an idealist few who decided to make a stand. Rico, the Rico statue in the Ninth Body Congress in the early 70s, the weapon that was developed by Ron Goldstock and Bob Blakey, who wrote, actually wrote the statue, was put in place for us in law enforcement to be able to better control organized crime and investigate. The new laws, new technology, and informants that ultimately work together to bring down the mob. Well, needless to say, the convictions of many of the Bonanno family members, including Joe Messina, was very satisfying to uh, many law enforcement people. Next week, Mafia Bonus 2, The Crackdown. This has been an Audio Boom and World Media Rights co-production hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley and Rachel Jacobs and Bettina Vasquez for World Media Rights. We had editing help from David Markowitz with additional production from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabingua. David McNabb is the series creative director and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Thanks to St. Martin's Press for sponsoring this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And if you've got some time, give us a review.